Well, there's an old lady who lived in the shoe. No, there's, oh. <laughs> you know, there's one place you're a little... You know, and again, you know, yeah, yeah. The, the lighting's good. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> and being you there? I want it. You happy with it? Yeah. 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 Chronological order necessarily. Right. Some of the questions are redundant. So it's just gonna be conversational then? I mean yeah. okay. So I can just kinda go on. Yeah. <laughs> I don't wanna if I if I start getting too far off the subject, just let me know. <laughs> That's okay then. I tend to chatter a lot, you know. We have speed bump. The more the better that way the editors can, you know, pick and right. choose some good sound bites. Okay. Johnny, first of all, thank you very much for taking the time for this interview. Okay. You're much. welcome. Uh, Johnny, why are there so many Elvis impersonators, do you think? Why are there so many Elvis impersonators? Um, that's a good question. Actually, um, I think it's because there are, number one, most of, most of the ones I know are, are fans first. And they love Elvis's music. And with the widespread of karaoke and ability of people to, able to sing music in their homes, uh, in a nightclub or you know, even a family gathering or whatever, um, people love singing the Elvis music, and if uh, they have a decent voice, and um, they might just kind of get into the whole thing, you know, with the whole impersonation. There's contests all over the country and all over the world, so a lot of people say, hey, you've been doing this karaoke thing for a while, why not get into a contest? And then uh, from that, they may start trying to build a career out of it. So I think that's why there's so many Elvis impersonators today. Um, what is it about Elvis that made you want to be uh, an Elvis impersonator? What did, uh, let's see, what made me want to be an Elvis impersonator about Elvis? Um, well, uh, you know, I grew up singing his music and singing gospel music in church. And while I was singing in church, my mom would always look at me and say, Johnny, stop singing like Elvis. You sound like Elvis. I'm like, Mom, I'm just singing. And uh, there's no other way. Uh, it just kind of, I fell into it. I mean, me personally. I don't know how other fellows do it, but I, I kind of just fell into it. And... Um, you know, I started off, uh, in particular, I was working at a restaurant, and they had a nightclub that had, you know, this karaoke thing going on. And I'd go over there and sing a couple of Elvis songs, and pretty soon people are like, you know, requesting me to do more and more. And um, I got on with a singing telegram agency in Chicago, and, and I just started working with them and put together a show. And uh, that's kind of how it took off. But uh, as far as, like, for Elvis, I've always been a fan since, since I was... Uh, old enough to listen to music. Uh, always listen to the oldies and and um, at the time, you know, when I was a child, Elvis was still around and, and his movies were still coming out, uh, mainly more his concert footage, you know, movies, Aloha. I remember when that was released in the album, my father had a copy of that and I remember driving around his car, he always had eight track tape playing of Elvis, <laughs> cranking away. So just as far as back as I can remember, I've been an Elvis fan. I think that's why I kind of related to that, and, and my voice had a very similar quality when I sang. So that's how I got, it, got into it. <coughs> do you feel, uh, do no. people feel, and I feel? Hold on one second. Bring this up. All right. Okay. Excuse on, me. I see the wire there, baby. Do you? Fix the wire. There we go. Let's move it over a little bit. There we go. Okay. Um, what I'm trying to say is, have people told you you resemble Elvis? Well, yes. Um, people tell me I, I resemble Elvis, but, but you know, I kind of I try to. Um, you know, the hair and the makeup. I'm actually a natural blonde, so I have to dye my hair. And, uh, you know, over the years, I try to get more of the look, you know. Um, uh, just kind of, you know, look, most of it's natural, but except for the hair and, and the makeup, you know, but uh, the rest of it's all, all natural. Uh, at one point, did have my nose it had been broken from a, a fight in high school, and uh, did have that straightened out a little bit. But uh, that's about the only thing I've had done to my face. Um, I'm sure after you do shows, do people ask you for an autograph? And if so, how does how does that make you feel? And what do you sign? Um, yeah, you know, after show, people come up to me, ask for autographs. Uh, if I've passed out scarves during the show, they want me to sign the scarves. Um, they buy photo, you know, photos and that sort of thing, and I autograph those. Or I've had people ask me to sign body parts. Uh, um, it's 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 kind of cool. Um, 
I always sign my own name. I don't sign Elvis or something. I might uh, once in a while, you know, sign my own name and then say uh, in tribute to Elvis or something like that, you know, or I'll put, you know, Elvis uh, tribute or Elvis in quotation marks, something like that, but never, never pretend to be Elvis. You know, there's only one Elvis Presley. All right, changing subjects. Did Elvis have a twin brother? Um, you know, Elvis did have a twin brother. Um, he, he died at birth when the, when the two twins were born, you know, when, when they were both born. And I believe, uh, uh, I believe they're identical twins, actually. So, uh, you know, I guess, you know, if they'd had hospitals at the time and, or the, the, the kids had been born at a hospital instead of a shotgun shack, they might have had a chance of uh, surviving. I don't know the situation. I just know that he passed away at birth. Um, yeah, and, and speaking of Aaron, on his gravestone, it says A-A-R-O-N. <clears throat> when on mm -hmm. his birth certificate, supposedly, there's only one A. Do you know why Elvis made the change and wanted two A's in his middle name? So you're saying that on the gravestone is A-A-R-O-N? Mm -hmm. uh, honestly, I don't know. I, I mean, it could have been the engravers, you know, that whoever engraved it could have just putting in a typo and not realized it, just because that is the typical spelling of it. Mm -hmm. um, that could have been what it was. It, it could have been the family that did it, but uh, I really don't know about that one. Okay. Um, are you familiar, well, after uh, Elvis's um, twin brother died, um, how did that impact Elvis's life? Do we know? Well, he, he never really knew his, his twin brother, <laughs> so I really don't know how that affected his life. Um, I'm sure it affected his mother and the way she treated Elvis and you know yeah, I'm sure it was a really horrible thing for a mother to lose a child at birth like that and so I'm sure she really um, coddled Elvis you know and everybody knows he had a very close relationship with his mother and I'm sure that did have some effect to, to the way he was raised. That was good. Was Elvis ever told to stick to driving a truck and because he'll never make it as a singer? Was Elvis ever told to stick to driving a truck because I'd never make it as a singer? You know, uh, it wouldn't surprise me, but <laughs> back then, uh, people had never even heard of him. And his voice and, and his style of singing was probably pretty foreign. You know, uh, it kind of reminds me of the time, you know, like uh, uh, Garth Brooks always says, I never liked my voice. I don't understand why anybody else ever did. But, you know, everybody hears something differently, you know. And... Uh, same thing with Elvis, you know, maybe some people don't like his voice, some people do. A lot of people do, actually. But uh, at the time, maybe they thought, this cat's kind of crazy. <laughs> and uh, his style of music is just not my cup of tea. But, yeah, that could have happened. Okay. It's been said that Elvis got his big break by recording songs for his mother at Sun Records. Mm -hmm. How true is that story? Well, you know, as far as I know about Elvis went going into Sun Records and recording uh, My Happiness was the song. I believe at the time uh, it was a hit for Dean Martin, actually, you know, or maybe had been previous years before. And Dean Martin actually was Elvis's uh, favorite singer. And he went and recorded this. Now, I've heard two stories. I've heard he went in there to record it for his mother, number one, and maybe he did. And the other one is that he went in there to actually do a demo, uh, hope, hoping that maybe somebody would sign him to a record deal if, you know, down the, the line one day. Um, so there's, there could be truth to both of those stories, you know, he could have said, hey, I'm going to go record this for my mom, and hey, why not, you know, see if I can get it, uh, to a record company, see if they were interested in him, so. What were the first songs that he recorded, do you, do you know? Um, well, that first one was, uh, My Happiness, and, uh, then, uh, you know, I think about nine to ten months later, they brought him back, uh, they had remember, remember remembered him from that uh, original recording and they're looking for a fresh new sound somebody that was that was white that had kind of a, a black soulful voice and um, that kind of whole kind of gospel blues sound to their voice and so they remembered him having that that deepness and that that kind of range and and so they brought him back and um, I'm not sure exactly the first couple of songs I know the very first song that was a hit for him was that's all right mama or sometimes he would call it, that's all right, little mama. I was just going to ask you, hey, hang on, hang on. Bean, you got to take that thing. Down. They asked, how did Sam Phillips feel about his recordings? You know who Sam Phillips is? Yeah. 
Well, you know, I don't know how Sam Phillips felt about his recordings. I, I really don't. Um, obviously, he felt there was something there. Um, when he brought Elvis back after the first, you know, initial demo he had made. Um, I know that, uh, in, in, you know, not only the movies I've seen, but also the books I've read and that sort of thing, too, that, um, you know, originally they wanted him to record some country-style music, and he kept wanting to add a little more um, kind of rhythm and blues sound to it. And that's, you know, they kind of took some of these things that were kind of a try to him, and he had a little more bop to it, a little more... A little more bluesy kind of sound to it, and uh, you know, uh, that's I think that's when they realized that they had something there. What was what was Elvis's first hit, and how did the audiences respond? Well, um, when you asked me about his first hit, um, I guess his first hit would have been "That's All Right, Mama" because that was what really made him in Memphis. You know, with Dewey Phillips and his radio show, they played that, and uh, they get constant requests for that. That's really what put him on the map. Um, his first number one hit was, uh, I believe it was Heartbreak Hotel. So, I mean, <laughs> I don't know which one you're asking about, whether it be That's All Right, Little Mama or, or, uh, or Heartbreak Hotel. Which, whichever one you think you remember is fine. Which one I remember. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you already answered that question. Yeah. So, moving on. Why did the Ed Sullivan Show censor his third appearance? <clears throat> well, the, the reason I think that Ed Sullivan uh, censored his, his third appearance was the fact that uh, he had been uh, moving before, you know, kind of dancing to the music and bopping to the music. And uh, here's a, a, a fun little story is I have a friend of mine named Kay Wheeler who happened to be Elvis's very first fan club president. Uh, she had contacted him out of Dallas. He was coming to Dallas to do a show, and she'd heard about it, and she'd already um, heard his music and fell in love with him. And she contacted the radio station asking if there's any other, you know, fan clubs for him that she could join and participate in his, his upcoming concert. And they said, no, there's not one. So she contacted um, uh, Colonel Tom Parker and says, you know, mind if I start an Elvis fan club here for him in, here in Dallas? And he says, go right ahead. Well, uh, they advertised on the radio, and in particular, the uh, radio station uh, was not real big Elvis fans. They would play his music, but the particular DJ was not an Elvis fan. And uh, uh, Kay asked them, you know, mind if I give an announcement that I'm starting an Elvis fan club? And he was like, sure, maybe you'll get a couple of members. I'll, I'll go ahead and announce it for you. Well, she got 2,000 members the first week. And uh, so by the time Elvis got to his show in Dallas, it was completely sold out. And they had to move it to a, a bigger venue. And uh, from that point on, they became good friends. And she was also in a bunch of movies with Gene Vincent and, and a bunch of the other rockabilly stars at the time. And uh, she did a thing called the bop. She was known as the queen of the bop. Well, she actually taught Elvis those moves uh, that became his signature moves. Uh, he was back, or she was backstage at one of his shows he was doing at high school. And she's bopping all over the back, and he kept looking, going, what in the world is she doing? So at the end of the show, he come up and said, what in the world were you doing, those moves? And she's like, oh, I do this thing called the bop. He goes, well, show me how to do that. And from that point on, he really was shaking. Now, he was shaking before, he was really moving the stage then. But uh, that's a little interesting fact uh, my friend Kay Wheeler did. <laughs> so what, were the, what do you think the censors were afraid of? Um, honestly, I think that the censors at the time were just afraid of inciting uh, and moral, you know, and the, the morality was, you know, and they, they thought that it was kind of lascivious to move like that. Uh, it was indecent to move in front of the cameras and shake your booty, <laughs> you know, that sort of thing, and shake your legs and, and incite, you know, women to want to scream. Uh, so they, I can understand time. It was, uh, you know, kind of a time of more, a lot of moral dilemma going on. And rock and roll, had, it was just brand new, you know, at the time. So they really didn't know how to take it. How did Elvis come to join the uh, Army? Um... Elvis came to join the Army because he was drafted, actually. And instead of using his money and his power and, and connections to fight it, you know, he says, no, I'm going to do my duty. Uh, if, they ask, if the U.S. government asks me to go serve for them, I'll, I'll go serve. So he went and served for two years. And uh, that's how he ended up getting drafted. I mean, he, just, he was just on, he was on the drafted just like anybody else was. What, 
was Elvis afraid of how this would affect his career joining the military? Yeah, you know, Elvis and the Colonel were both kind of, you know, worried about how joining the Army and, and, and going off overseas for a couple of years was going to affect his career. But it, in actuality, what it did is it endeared him to the, the, the masses, uh, the older generation, you know, the veterans who were, had gone before him, had, you know, it kind of endeared uh, Elvis to those crowds as well. So it actually built his popularity. And of course, you know, he received thousands of letters while so he was gone too of support and everything. So it actually was a, a, a good move for him to do that. And, you know, he, and, and Elvis was a very patriotic person too. Loved uh, the America, loved the U.S. How do you think he felt about having his hair cropped like that? Um, when Elvis got his hair cut, um, I don't know if you've ever seen the footage. I'm sure it was a shock to him, but, uh, you know, everybody else had it too. So he just had to, he just, he became a regular GI, just like all the other fellas. Um, since Elvis was such a big star and being in the military, uh, do you think, there was any animosity on the part of other soldiers, and if so, how, do, you, do you know how Elvis dealt with his uh, his fellow soldiers? Can you, can you say that question again? I'm sorry. Um, being the big star that he was, mm -hmm. and he got some special treatment. Do you think um, other soldiers didn't like the fact that he was in their unit because of well. That? You know, when Elvis went over to Germany and served there, you know, there was that stigma that he might be treated differently because he was a star. Now, I think the only people that treated him differently were the other soldiers, not the, not the superiors, because they treated him like a soldier. And he asked, do not treat me any different than anyone else. He had KP duty. He still had to go out and, and set up all night, you know, for, for night watch and, and, and just like everybody else. Um, he had to march like everyone else. He had to clean, you know, the latrines like everyone else. He had to do everything a military man did. And, they, and when they saw that he did that, they, they gave him a lot of respect for that, that he didn't try to use his celebrity to, uh, to get special privileges. The only privilege I believe he did have, because he had the money, was uh, he was uh, able to have a house off the base. And he only stayed there on the weekends. During the rest of the time, during his uh, tour and his duty, he would, he would stay in the barracks. Here's another redundant question, but I'll ask it again anyway. How did being away in the Army affect his career? How did being away in the Army affect his career? Yes. Yeah. Um, I think in a positive light. I think that you know, it, it endeared him more to the, the, the American uh, you know, uh, families and the, and the fans. They, uh, you know, they saw that he did his patriotic duty and wasn't afraid to, to go out there and serve. And um, I really think it uh, built his popularity. Of course, it gave the press something to write about, too, and to keep him in the, in the limelight. So uh, it, I think it actually worked to his benefit to some degree. You know, had he had stayed back home and not gone over there, probably would have lost a lot of fans. And people thought, well, well he's kind of dodging his, uh, his, his uh, duty, you know, to the U.S. Mm -hmm. When did Elvis become interested in karate and, and why? You know, um, I believe Elvis uh, became interested in karate while he was in Germany. I think he saw a couple of karate demonstrations by some of the other soldiers who had uh, been stationed uh, in, in Japan and Okinawa. And, they, and he said, man, I want to learn that sort of thing. So he actually uh, took on some private lessons while he was in, the, in Germany for a while. He, he took uh, some of the other soldiers and they went and trained with a, a private karate instructor in, in that area. And as a matter of fact, uh, one of his own trips that he took to Paris was because he was going to train with the martial arts instructor in, in, uh, in France. And there's a lot of stories about what happened while he was in France. <laughs> you want to share some of them with us that you've heard of? Um, well, uh, you know, over the years, I've worked with a lot of the people that Elvis knew, Joe Esposito and Al DeVoren, who was a dear friend uh, before he was passed away uh, in a car accident recently. Um, and I hear stories, and they tell me things. Uh, you know, Elvis went, uh, you know, to Paris to, to, to study with a karate instructor, and he took a bunch of the fellows with him. And um, while they were there, uh, I believe they went to a, kind of a burlesque show. And... Of course, when all the girls heard that Elvis Presley was in the audience, they, of course, were giving him all the attention and everything. And uh, after the show, uh, Elvis and the guys had invited them to go out for a drink or something at a local nightclub. Well, it turns out all the girls lived in a dormitory, and the dormitory closed at a certain time, like 1 o'clock. If they weren't in the dorms by then, they were locked out. Well, they weren't back in time for that, so they all ended up staying at Elvis's hotel that night. <laughs> 
And the next day, the uh, the uh, the nightclub owner had to call Elvis's hotel and say, "Where's my girls? Where's my girls?" You know, because they they hadn't come back yet, <laughs> and the show was about to start. <laughs> so, um, oh. As far as karate goes, was was Elvin, Elvis any good at it? Um, you know, as far as Elvis's uh, martial art background, and if he was any good, you know. His highest rank that he got from uh, Ed Parker was a uh, seventh degree um, black belt, which is a, is a master, um, almost grandmaster level. Grandmaster is uh, eighth and above. Um, Ed Parker himself was eighth or ninth degree. And, um, you know, I know that Elvis uh, trained with uh, several people, you know, several people, not only in the, in the military while he was in, in Germany, but also when he got back, there was a local instructor. Um, uh, that that had the Paso Raru style, a Paso Raru style, and uh, he trained with him. He also trained with Bill Wallace, Bill Superfoot Wallace, who was a world champion. Um, uh, Wayne Carmen also trained with him. Uh, there's a lot of the the guys I know that I've met in the past who who actually trained with him. And I know Ed Parker is a pioneer in the in the karate industry and the whole, you know, uh, he brought, you know, he was friends with Bruce Lee and a, and a lot of the bigger karate names and. I'm sure he wouldn't have given him a seventh degree black belt if he didn't have some kind of skill. So I'm sure he was, I'm sure he could hold his own. And there's been this myth that says Elvis could kill an opponent in less than 10 seconds. Do you believe that? And why do you think people say that? Well, if they, they say people that Elvis could kill somebody in 10 seconds, I absolutely believe it. I actually have four black belts myself. I'm third degree in, in two of those. And I've trained, I'm actually certified in six martial arts myself. Um, and uh, it's very impossible. I mean, you know, I've trained uh, military, I've trained FBI agents and police departments, and I actually teach them how to take someone out in less than three seconds. And um, I've had students who have taken out four, four opponents in about 10 seconds in, in real street fights and uh, in real altercations. So it's very possible. So... Elvis being involved in karate and uh, being so uh, efficient in it, how does that add to his mythology? Um, well, I, honestly, you know, at the time that Elvis was performing and, and, and added a lot of karate moves to his uh, stage performance, he would actually stop in the middle of his show and give a karate demonstration. Uh, a lot of people had never seen it. The only exposure they'd had uh, was in the you know early 70s to Bruce Lee movies. Before that... Jack hadn't seen too much of, uh, of uh, uh, martial arts or anything. Maybe a couple of movies that, like James Coburn had done. He had studied karate, and he actually became a student of Bruce Lee for after a while. Um, but uh, I think that kind of added, like, I mean, they were. It was probably some people's first exposure to the martial arts was to see Elvis putting on some of the moves and doing the kicks and and then doing his demonstrations, that sort of thing. How and why did Elvis arrange a meeting with? Um President Nixon? Well, I believe that the reason that Elvis wanted to meet with President Nixon was he wanted to become a, a, a certified DEA agent, you know, drug enforcement agent. So he, um, you know, if anybody could <laughs> get to the president, it would have been Elvis Presley. Um, I, I believe the story is that he actually just got on a plane, didn't take any of his uh, bodyguards or anything, just took off in the middle of the night, got on a plane and uh, took off for Washington, D.C. and says, I want to meet the, the president. And he shows up at the White House. And they're like, uh, you know, Elvis is here, Elvis Presley. <laughs> so he got, uh, he got an audience with uh, President Nixon and says, I'd like to get uh, the DEA agent uh, badge. That's why he wanted to meet with them. Was, did he become a federal agent? Um, I believe he got for full certification, full, you know, I know he got the badge. He got the badges for the guys. Um, I believe he did get full certification. Now, whether he was just an honorary member, you know, that, that could have been a possibility, uh, but he maybe did have the powers of arrest. One more question. Okay. Okay. Uh, why did Elvis want to fight, uh, fight drug use, and how do you think he could actually have helped? Well, I, I know that uh, Elvis was, was, you know, adamantly opposed to the use of marijuana, the use of uh, like LSD and all the popular drugs at the time. Um, so I, I know that he just felt, you know, with his uh, his celebrity, he could, you know, actually 
be kind of a, a role model in that way that, you know, hey, you know, telling people to stay off the drugs. And as far as him fighting it, I mean, no, there's no way he could go undercover. <laughs> and, you know, maybe he, uh, you know, his performances in traveling and, and you know, living in, in Las Vegas kind of saw a lot of it and it kind of turned him off. And maybe he felt like, you know, if I had some power, I could kind of, you know, maybe uh, curtail some of this, this activity that's going on. So I guess there's a rumor that uh, Elvis had wanted to become a DEA agent to kind of fight the popularity of, of the Beatles because they kind of introduced, uh, you know, the young kids to kind of a drug culture, you know, LSD and marijuana, that sort of thing. And, you know, it's, it's no secret that the Beatles experiments, you know, experimented with that sort of thing and, uh, and influenced a lot of their music, you know, later on. You know, their first uh, 1964 era, they, they played a lot of the old rock and roll, and they did some covers, did some Chuck Berry, and they did quite a few other things. Um, now, as far as Elvis wanting to fight that and become a DE agent because he thought if he could help fight against the drugs that it would ki kill the popularity of the Beatles, I really don't know if there's any, any warrant to that because I, I know El Elvis was a fan of the Beatles, as, El as the, fans were, or the Beatles were fans of Elvis. They said before Elvis, there was nothing. There was no rock and roll, you know. And um, they always gave homage to Elvis. And at one point, they even went to Elvis's house in uh, California and spent the whole day jamming with him. And uh, years later, you know, Elvis even covered a couple of songs. He sang Hey Jude and something and, and uh, a couple of other songs of theirs. So I think he liked the Beatles and... Anything new, it influenced him. You know, Elvis was a, a fan of music. You know, he listened to everything from gospel to, to um, opera, you know, to, to country and everything. I mean, he, li he listened to everything and he appreciated everybody's music. And one thing about Elvis was he goes, you know, without my fans, I don't have anything. And he says, this could all be gone tomorrow. So... I think, you know, and the Beatles were his fans, so how could he, he, how could he turn his back on them? I don't think he could. Right. That was good. Um, can you describe Elvis' pre prescription drug use at all? Can I describe Elvis' prescription drug use? Well, I believe uh, it first was introduced to Elvis in the, in, while he was in the Army, and uh, that's a known fact, uh, that... Uh, they would use uh, things to keep them awake, you know, and keep them getting frostbite when they're, you know, standing uh, guard, you know, at the, at the bases in Germany. And, you know, he kind of got used to having the uppers and the, and the sleeping pills to be able to sleep, you know, and come down from the uppers. And it just kind of stuck with him. And you can imagine how over years and stuff that his body became accustomed to that. And I think that that was really pretty much what he used, you know. Uh, later on, I believe that there was uh, pain pills because he also had really bad arth arthritis. If you can uh, see photos of him in the last couple of years of his performances, you know you could see that his his fingers were really um, kind of starting to bend up a little bit. Um, he had uh, I've been told he had some you know bone a lot of aches and pains in his, in his joints. I guess you know from years of performing on stages, hardwood stages moving and shaking and all that well it's just like you ask a dancer you, know, you see a dancer when they first start out you know professionally uh, around uh, 19 20 years old 30 20 you know 30 you know 30 years old and 40 years old it's they can they don't move quite the same and i'm sure that that affected elvis's you know uh, ligaments and his bones and so he got more involved into the uh, the painkillers and uh, pain relievers and a lot of the um muscle relaxants and stuff they also you know, kind of slow down your digestive system too, which caused a lot of the bloating. And then also he was on steroids um, for the pain that he was in from his arthritis and, and the joints. Um, who, who was Dr. Nick? Um, I don't know Dr. Nick's full name, <laughs> but uh, Dr. Nick was his personal physician who uh, was on call, uh, you know, and he would make house calls uh, so Elvis didn't have to go out, you know, which was very difficult for Elvis to leave the gates of Graceland when he was home. Fans, you know, if, if you want to go to a movie theater, he had to, uh, clo after it was closed, rent it out so that he and the guys could go watch a movie. Otherwise, the fans would mob them. Um, but Dr. Nick was uh, his, his personal f physician that would come and visit him and, and check on him uh, at, his at his home.
Uh, some people blame him for getting him, him addicted and, and not getting him off the pills. How do you feel about that? Well, some people blame Dr. Nick for not being able to, you know, wean him off the drugs. But here's the situation um, that I've been told is uh, how do you stop a man from, from hurting himself, you know? How can you keep someone like Elvis Presley, who's got a lot of power, a lot of friends, and a lot of money, from getting the things that he feels he needs and wants? Um, you know, if Dr. Nick wouldn't give him prescriptions or help, you know, him obtain what he wanted, and he didn't a lot of times. I mean, most of the time, he, he tried to deny him, and if that didn't work, he would give him a lesser prescription, or he would even give him sugar pills. And... Um, if Elvis didn't feel the effects, he'd go to another doctor, you know, or he'd send somebody else and, and get it, you know. So someone like Elvis Presley, very hard to keep down, you know. If, if he wanted something bad enough, he would get it. To your recollection, how and, and when did Elvis die? Well, I remember the day Elvis died. It was, uh, you know, August 16th, 1977. I was out with my family in Biloxi, Mississippi, where Elvis used to actually vacation earlier, uh, like in the late 50s and that sort of thing. And um, uh, I came in from the beach with my family, turned on the television, and heard that Elvis Presley had died. And I flipped all the channels, and it was everywhere. And uh, so that was where, you know, that was when he died. And it, it just, you know, I think the whole nation mourned for him at that point. I called my uh, father and my stepmother in the next room, and I told them, turn on, the Elvis, uh, turn on the television, Elvis has died. And my stepmother says, that's not even funny. She thought I was joking. I said, no, turn on the television. You heard her turn on the television, and then you heard a scream from the next door, just screaming and, and crying, because we were all Elvis fans. And I think the thing about Elvis, uh, I think everybody felt he was part of their family. So how do you think the nation reacted? Exactly. I think the nation reacted uh, as though they lost a family member, somebody very close to them. You know, through all the years of seeing Elvis in the movies and, and listened to his, his songs over and over, and, you know, Elvis had a super quality about his ability to, to sing a song. And they say that, you know, it went, it went from his head through his heart and then out of his mouth, each song. And that's, and that's very true. Uh, when you listen to any Elvis song, you feel that he's really singing it and, and, and really felt the words before he actually sang the words. And I think that's how he was able to touch so many fans and have so many fans. Why do so many people think that he's still alive? Um, honestly, I don't know why uh, there's people that think he's still alive. Uh, all of the Memphis Mafia members that I know and have met and worked with, um, uh, you know, um, from Sonny and, and um, Joe Esposito and Al Devorn, they said, you know, if Elvis was alive, he would still be on stage. He loved his fans. He loved, he loved to perform and he loved to sing. And if he was alive, there's no way you could keep him down. He would not just fake his death and disappear and live on a Hawaiian island someplace, you know. There's just no way he could do that. Um, what would you tell someone that if they ask you, Elvis is still alive, isn't he? What would you tell them? But what I just told you, I would tell, you know, if someone asked me if Elvis is alive, I said, I'd say no way. I mean, he loved his fans too much. You know, he loved his family. You know, I actually met his Uncle Vester before he passed away, and they all mourned him when he died. It's, you know, if there's just no way that Elvis is hiding out someplace, you know, uh, he loved his fans too much, and he loved his family too much to do that to him. What are some of the conspiracy theories surrounding Elvis's life and his death that you, you're, you've heard over the years? Uh, um, what are some of the myths I've heard over the years about Elvis? Well, you know, the ones where he is, you know, living in Hawaii or, or Michigan somewhere working at a Burger King or, been, you know, Elvis sightings and that sort of thing. Uh, just not true. Um, you know... Um, Really, I don't know uh, too many wacky things that I've heard about Elvis. You know, the, the, one, the good things I have heard are, are basically that he was always a very good person. Um, he treated everybody the way he wanted to be treated, and he always felt like, you know, hey, this could all be gone tomorrow. So, you know, he, he, never, he never took anything for advantage. You know, he never took granted anything for granted. Um, 
even his relationship with the colonel. You know, the colonel, had, most of his career was getting 50% of everything Elvis made, which is unheard of for a manager. Normally it's 15%, maybe 20 at the most. But the colonel was getting that, and when the colonel came to him about a year or two before he died and asked for 55%, Elvis said, I wouldn't be here without you, so he agreed to it, you know. Um, that's just the kind of person he was. He, you know, he, he, he made a living. He was happy. He, you know, he wasn't greedy or anything like that. And especially, and everybody knows, you know, some of the legends about him giving away cars. And that's a very true thing, you know. Uh, it, it stemmed from his being a very poor child growing up and having not, you know, having nothing. And, and wanting for things that he just couldn't afford. And... One of the things that uh, I think is uh, kind of a legend about his eating habits, you know, um, I believe that also stemmed from his childhood that sometimes they would eat a meal and they may miss a meal for a couple of days and they might not know when they're going to eat again. So Elvis would kind of like eat what he could and as much as he could fit into his stomach, you know, because he never knew when the next meal was going to be. This is my theory on this. And so he kind of kept that up as he got older, you know. And, you know, they say that he could put away a few hamburgers and shakes and fries, you know. Um, and again, too, you know, back in the 50s, that was just coming out. That it really hadn't been, it was a popular food. It was very quick to get. You could go out to a malt shop and grab one of those or a diner. And uh, I think that's why he ate like he did. He was just kind of used to not having a whole lot. And then when he, when he did get it, he said, I better take advantage of this and, and just eat as much as I can because I don't know when my next meal is. I think that kind of mentality stuck with him through his years. And when his metabolism slowed down, you know, it had a lot to do with uh, the weight gain, that sort of thing. Say it again. How does, how, the, how does the belief that Elvis is still alive tie into the public's fascination with Elvis impersonators? How does the belief that Elvis is still alive tie into the fascination with Elvis impersonators? I honestly don't know that many people that believe he's still alive. Very few people, you know, believe that anymore maybe maybe 10 years ago maybe 25 years ago 30 years ago when he passed away they didn't want to believe he was dead you know just same with it happened with bruce lee it happened with uh you know marilyn monroe people didn't really want to believe it and because they hate letting go of somebody like that and i think that's you know been proven 30 years later he still hasn't been seen he's i think people i think that myth has kind of been established that it that is strictly just a myth so maybe the, the way that they want to hear it is, uh, because people are saying Elvis is alive and obvious, obviously he isn't, having an impersonator there sort of brings him back for them. You know, um, when people go to the, uh, the impersonation shows or they go to a tribute show, um, you know, a lot of us like to be called Elvis tribute artists because we, we do our tribute to Elvis. And we try to do it as a reference because we are fans of Elvis first and foremost. Um, what I tried to do, and I know many other guys tried to do, is just get a glimpse or give somebody a glimpse of what it was like to be at an Elvis concert, whether it be the style, the look, the moves, and the voice, or a combination of all of those things. We want people to feel like that's what it was like to see Elvis. That's part of the magic that he left behind. And I think that's what we try to do is recreate some of that magic that Elvis left behind with his music and his style. And, and his attitude towards life and, and, and his fellow human being, that sort of thing. So I, I, when, when I'd perform, i try to leave people with that, that feeling that they just saw a little glimpse of what Elvis was like on stage. That was an awesome answer. <laughs> that was nice. I know they're going to use that whole piece. <laughs> you want me to okay. roll on? <laughs> oh, oh. Okay, we already went through the Aaron thing, right? Yeah. His, his, his middle name... Aaron is misspelled mm -hmm. Aaron on right. his gravestone. And what was the significance of this? I think yeah. you already answered yeah. that. Yeah, I already did that one. And I already asked you that. Um, what was Elvis's career like before he died? And how did dying change that? Elvis's career, what? Yeah. In other words, what I think they, they want to know is, what was Elvis's career like before he died? How was he doing? Was he doing good or, or was he on his way out? Okay, all right. I kind of got an idea. Um, you know, the thing about Elvis's passing away and how it has changed, um, you know, 
before Elvis passed away, like I said, a lot of his money was going to the colonel. Um, Elvis had kind of gotten into a groove of giving away a lot of money, not only to charities, but also people that worked for him and friends and just helping people out. And I think that's why he was so, you know, endeared by so many was because he did, he just helped everybody he could. And, but after a while, you know, when he passed away, he only had two or three million dollars left in the bank. And you would think that it would have been hundreds of millions because of all the records he sold. But a lot of the money was given away or spent on charities and that sort of thing. And um, what they did, you know, Priscilla, when she took over the estate and turned it into what it is today and to recently, now they make over 30 to $40 million a year, you know, which is way more than Elvis made probably most of his life, you know. Um, but that's every year that they're making that just because there's so many Elvis fans worldwide that they still buy his records, buy the compilations, they buy the, uh, the DVDs and the music and the movies and just everything. Supporting, you know, Elvis Presley Enterprises and, and um, what Elvis left behind for everybody. So dying changed um, the dynamics of his money making and right. his popularity. Well, you know, you know, passing away, I don't know if that helped his popularity because he was very popular when he, you know, was alive. Um, but just like a Picasso painting, at the time he painted those, you could probably get them for a few hundred dollars, you know. But now they're worth millions of dollars because you can't get any more. There are no new Picassos coming out. So it's kind of along the same lines. There are new, new Elvis records coming out because Elvis is not around to make those records. So, um, you know it kind of increases in the value that way um, and people st still love you know getting new things that maybe compilations or uh, seeing the movies re-edited um, recently they had uh, the that's the way it was Elvis you know live on stage at the International re-edited back about maybe six seven years ago and I remember seeing it like it was like, oh, the newest album. I, I couldn't wait to see it. And when they broadcast it live, it was just, it was just amazing because it was like you're right there in the front row, and you got to see this great footage of him performing him like right at his best. And um, that's kind of what he left us behind there too. Kind of going off the subject. <laughs> I saw this. This isn't a question or anything. I saw this American Idol had Celine Dion. And Elvis Presley together on stage singing a song like a duet. It was amazing how they did that. Right. It, it seemed like he was really there. Mm hmm But anyway. I was act that was actually a buddy of mine, um, Ryan Pelton, that was the, the Elvis impersonator they used for that. Um It wasn't a real Elvis? I no. Think well, Elvis was well they lips. used him for the far shots when you couldn't see him from a distance when mm -hmm. you saw him from a distance and from behind. That was the only time that you saw Ryan. The rest of it was like kinda Superimposed with with Elvis's, you know, from from the footage from the '68 comeback special. Yeah, it was great. They, they did a good job on that. Are Oprah, Oprah Winfrey, and Elvis related? And what have you heard about this claim? Have I heard that Oprah and uh, Elvis are related? That's the first time I've ever heard that, so I really couldn't comment on it. Okay. I just. Uh, do you know which version? Anything's of possible. <laughs> I've never heard that either. You never know who your cousins are, you know. <laughs> um, which version of Elvis appeared on a U.S. postage stamp? And how was this chosen, to your knowledge? Well, you know, back, um, I'm trying to remember the year it came out. <clears throat> I, I know it was in the mid-90s uh, that Elvis, uh, the new postage stamp came out and was released and they chose there was a i remember they had uh they had a choice of a 1950s picture 1968 in the leather and the 1970s uh in white jumpsuit with american eagle and for some reason i guess because people want to remember elvis as that young boy from memphis tennessee that, that started out and was so humble and and um talented that that's why they chose the stamp from the 1950s, you know, to to represent Elvis, and that was the one that they they mass produced and sold. I believe that's why they did that. Okay, yeah, it was the 1950s era. Um, there's a couple of general questions like, why do they call Elvis Presley the king? You know, Elvis was the very first. I mean, 
Back in the day when Elvis came out with rock and roll, uh, before the term was used, uh, he was known as the hillbilly cat. Um, you know, and he even said that, that his style of music was a mix of gospel, rhythm, and blues. And, you know, he also did country and everything else. But he, I think the reason he was called the king was he was uh, one of the first artists to cross over in all genres from rhythm and blues or R&B or, you know, uh, gospel and country music. And he was kind of the king of all of those. So in a way, you know, just like Howard Stern calls himself king of media or now whatever, for whatever reason that is. But he, you know, because, uh, you know, Elvis, no matter what media he did, whether it was the movies even, you know, he, he was a draw. He, he was the number one draw. The number one, you've, no matter what Elvis movie it, it was, good or bad, it still sold out. You know, they still made money off of these things. He was definitely the king in that regard. So whether it be he's recording country music or gospel music or rhythm and blues or rock and roll, it was he was definitely the king. You think he liked that title? Um, you know, it's funny because uh, Elvis always, he would come out on stage and, you know, being the humble person he was, when people called him the king, he says, don't call me the king. There's only one king, and that's Jesus Christ. And then he goes, that's, that's the king. So he was very humble about that whole title. Nice. Why did Elvis start making movies, you think? Um, why did Elvis start making movies? Well, basically, uh, Elvis had a love for the movies. Elvis uh, wanted to be an actor. He wanted to be a, a James Dean. He wanted to be a Cary Grant. He, he loved all those things. He, he loved going to the movies. And he always wanted to be an actor. He wanted to be taken, you know, as a serious actor uh, when he did start making movies. And if you look at the first three or four movies he made, uh, he had a little more say-so in, in what was going on. Um, his first movie was Love Me Tender, originally called The Reno Brothers, but they thought, we have Elvis Presley in here, and his number one hit is, is Love Me Tender. Let's call it Love Me Tender. Um, it was his first uh, attempt at acting, and you know, and you could tell he was new at it, but he did a great job. He, every character he did, he, you, you could believe he was that character. And that's important as an actor. His next few movies were King Creole and Loving You, and they were very good roles, very juicy, and Jailhouse Rock, you know? It's classic, you know? And he got a lot of chance to to play uh, a convict in there that was, you know, hot-headed and that sort of stuff throughout the movie who who kind of warms up to the girl and uh, becomes something overnight, you know, as a sen singing sensation and all that kind of related to his life. I think from that movie on, they thought, let's give him that formula again. It works so well for Tailhouse Rock, let's do that again. Let's add a lot of music to the thing. And that's kind of got into a whole other genre of music, you know, uh, movies. They'll probably walk by, you know, those people. Yeah, you ask people around here to be quiet, they're like, <laughs> you know, up yours. <laughs> uh, Still speeding? Still speed. Um, when and why did Elvis buy Graceland? When and why did Elvis buy Graceland? Well, at the time that Elvis bought Graceland, he was living just uh, actually around the corner from it, uh, not far from this, on a street called Audubon. It was a smaller house, I think three or four bedroom, uh, one level ranch, you know, he had uh, moved his family into uh, when he first started making money. And I believe he kept driving past this big, nice house that a doctor owned with all this beautiful land and... Um, you know, when he got to the point where he was making enough money and found out it was for sale, uh, he wanted to put his family and his parents in a place where they could uh, live comfortably, you know, and they could all be together and have plenty of room and have room for friends and family to come and visit. So um, I believe he act he actually purchased uh, Graceland for about $100,000 back in the day. Now. Now it would be priceless. You couldn't even imagine what it would cost you to, to own Graceland if, if you could, you know. But uh, I think that's why he wanted a, a place to call home that he could have all his friends and family around him. How did Elvis change rock and roll? 
How did Elvis cha change rock and roll? Well, um, kind of like I said earlier, at the time, uh, what was no on the scene with uh, the Sun Records at the time, you know, you had Johnny Cash recording there, Jerry Lee Lewis, Roy Orbison, uh, Carl Perkins, they were all recording at, at Sun Records. And rock and roll was uh, just uh, the brand new baby. It was a kind of an off breed, just like, you know, like, like rap and R&B, you know, uh, kind of mixed together and, and, and became its own entity uh, after, you know, Motown. It's kind of like, you know, I'd say the R&B and rap and that sort of thing are kind of the, the, uh, the babies of Motown, you know, and, and that sort of thing. Um, I might be wrong, but uh, rock and roll was the baby of, like I said, gospel rhythm and blues. And um, the influences he had, why is he different? Because he was the first, you know, one to actually do it and record it into that kind of style. Um, you know, it, it, and his version of Blue Suede Shoes even was different than Carl Perkins. And Carl Perkins is the one that wrote it, you know. Um, Elvis had a way of just taking somebody's song and making it his own. And that was very unique. You know, very unique style, um, and that's that's uh, it's just like taking somebody's book and rewriting it. <laughs> I guess you know, not plagiarism, but I'm just saying, it, making it his own style. You know, and that that was the beauty of what Elvis did with 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 rock and roll, and that's how he was. You know, he was the for he was the forerunner of rock and roll. Got two minutes left, Harry. Okay, some would say um, there was no rock and roll before Elvis. Your response to that? Um, you know, uh, people say there was no rock and roll before Elvis. Uh, rock and roll was really in its infancy. There was styles of rock and roll. Like I said, uh, there was what's known as hillbilly, you know, hillbilly uh, music. Hillbilly music was a combination of, uh, of uh, country music added to a little faster pace of maybe the R&B, you know, and uh, there were other artists out there like Gene Vincent and a few others that were coming out who who um, were influencing that kind of music, you know, Buddy Holly, that sort of thing. They were, you know, uh, Richie Valens, the Big Bopper. They were all kind of, you know, there when it happened. Elvis just happened to have a, a unique voice and a unique style and was able to take that music and take it to another level. And. Um, it, may, it was kind of around, but it hadn't been polished yet. Let's just say I was polished what was coming out. <laughs>